All right, Seth. So you have selected for us uh, private practice or private practices, the story of a sex surrogate. The story of a sex surrogate. So tell us yeah. a little bit about why you chose this film and what's well, it Well, it's truly an obscure film. I had vague memories of this film. I think I saw it on maybe Bravo when they showed weird movies before they like became like every other cable channel. When they first started in like 99, 2001, they showed like obscure, independent kind of films. It was either Bravo or a similar channel. And I saw it. Inside the actor studio. What? Inside the the, get inside the actor studio then. Artsy fartsy stuff. Artsy fartsy stuff. So I saw it and I remembered it and stuck in my mind. And then years later, my friend went to a sex film festival. And they played this and she couldn't get over it. And I was like, is that the one with the 25 year old virgin named Kipper? And she's like, yeah, Kipper. So then last week we were talking and I was like, which of the folk horror should we do? And they said, no, we should do the documentary. Oh, this should be our first documentary. So this movie covers the exploration of two sexual problems by two psychology, sexology patients. Uh, One is John, who is divorced. He's 45, but he looks like he's about 65. uh, It's the 80s. Um, He's got a comb over and a sort of nervous, uh, perpetual, angry smile on his face. It's it's interesting. And then Kipper, who looks like, uh, the greatest American hero's ugly brother. Like he, he, he looks like that guy who was in. Um, but he's kind of, he's kind of like ugly, but in a good looking way with like kind of a good body. Yeah, he's got like the big and Wednesday hair. haircut. And he's uh, got nice hair. Yeah, like there's nice no hair. reason, there's no reason his looks should be preventing it's him from having looks, any problems with him. He has acute anxiety. He's terrified and he has a very experienced brother who's probably traumatized him worse, who is also in the movie. John, the other guy's two daughters and his ex-wife. Wait, wait, that's his brother? In the, I thought that was his buddy, his best friend. His no, that's his, his brother. Young, I think it's his younger brother, too. I think that really? was his younger brother. I think so, yeah. He yeah. loves women. He loves women and they're smoking cigarettes. I just got to say that. Let me interrupt. I loved it how they were smoking cigarettes like they were actually in a movie in 1980. Like that's how they were. Yeah, man, we're just gonna smoke. I love. I just thought that was so cute. Seth, I think. Please, it, please. I think it, the documentarian probably wanted to give them something to do, and said, "Why don't you two guys smoke?" Because it seemed. Yeah, because they didn't know what they were doing. Like they didn't know how to smoke. <laughs> um, like when you give actors cigarettes and you say smoke, and they they never went out to a bar and practiced for hours how to smoke. That's what Kipper and his brother look like when they're smoking. And then also we have the sex uh, surrogate. I'm blanking on her name. What's her name? Mo. Mo? Maureen. Maureen Sullivan. Maureen Sullivan. Maureen Sullivan. Her brother is in the movie. Her father (laughs) is in the movie, which is fun. And her psychiatrist is in the movie. And the sexologists that she works with. And Kippers and John and psychologists. Yes, and they're and neighbors. And Mo's neighbors. And Mo's neighbors. Oh, I yeah. love their outfits. They ask them, you know, about they never see people going in and out of the house. So yeah. um yeah, and so she I, runs a daycare too. The neighbor. Yeah, next. Run, the neighbor runs it's a all daycare. Good. It's all good. All good. <laughs> so I picked this because I thought, you know. This is an unusual subject. It's probably the most past time, like ahead of its time, that that got into like hacking the body, right? Like those people who are like, well, I'm not having sex, but I need intimacy. And I have a great relationship with my friends in the podcast, but nobody's holding me. So that's why today, folks, I called it my cuddle therapist to come over and hold me. Anyhow. But you can hack your body that way. And then, you know, go back to like grading papers or 
something like that. You know, you could just have. Did to you just a, mention a cuddle therapist? The cuddle therapist, yeah. So yes, I've like heard about that recently. I met a cuddler. Oh, you met a cuddler? I'm gonna play I a did. cuddle therapist in a movie. Yes, I, I had no idea that there was this whole world out there. Whole That's world. Part of what this well, that was. There's I think that was part there. of. I think that was part of Seth's inspiration because we, yeah. we we created a character and a narrative and a and a um, screenplay outline and now a screenplay based on the concept of it, like from the pr point of view of a protagonist who would try to get into that line of work as a therapist. Like in this movie, this woman is providing certain kinds of sexual services to help these men. And mm -hmm. what is particularly like heavy about, about her character is that she legitimately is in this to help these guys sort their shit out and to help herself sort her own shit out, which is always the case. I've never met a therapist in my life who isn't doing the therapy with the motivate because they're broken. I've never met a therapist who got into therapy because they're, they got their shit together and they want to help other people. Every therapist gets into therapy because they're broken. Maybe they've resolved some of their brokenness and now they want to help people. Oftentimes they're more broken than the people they're trying to help, which is not good. Um, but I see that a lot. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not going to say she's more broken than these men, but she's got a lot of issues. And I found all of them to be tragic characters, but I, I found her character to be the most tragic. And, and this is why. Um, I know it's not popular or fashionable to talk about uh, women in, in the way that I'm about to talk about women, but throughout most of human history, and now people are starting to come around to this, there have been serious consequences for a woman who spends a lot of her younger years either being promiscuous for the sake of exploring sexuality or using her sexuality for some kind of uh, monetary profit means for now me. the the reason and, and and it's and it's the consequences for a woman who's promiscuous are obviously much much different than for a man who's promiscuous um women have easy sexual access to men maybe not always to the man they want but women have easy sexual access men don't and the 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 issue that I saw was this, this is not a young woman at this point. I mean, by, by 80 standards, she's at least in her late twenties, if not into her thirties at this point. Was she 32? I don't remember. If, if I think so. And, and she was doing it for six years. And she'd been doing this for a long time. And she'd six done years. this That's with she multiple, had that, she had multiple, multiple, multiple hundreds, right? She's we're talking, we're talking a lot, a lot, a lot of men. And that, that takes its toll. And I think one of the things that we think in our culture is that, that practice makes perfect and knowing as many partners as, but if you meet somebody who's happily married or they found somebody that is finally, like they're in a functional relationship with and you ask them, so do you, are you happy that you, would, would you have preferred to have a lot more partners before you found this person? Or are you happy that you did it? Most people would say, and this goes for men too, on a certain level. Uh, you know, people would rather be in happy relationships than out there trying to either fix wounded men or uh, get find men who are going to fix their wounds or whatever. And clearly, there's a lot of that play going on here with her. And I after like doing the research into it, it seems like she found somebody and then like ended up with them for long term and got married and started. I don't know if she had kids or not. Seth sent me an article about a follow up. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. We, we'll talk about it. Talk. But but I the just, only thing I wanted to say is that like I went into this thinking, okay, this woman is crazy and these men are broken <laughs> and this is not and this is not going to fix them. And I came out of it thinking they're all really incredibly interesting people and characters with a very rich inner life and, and with with a very their rich kind of turmoil that they're in and i came out of it feeling like the men kind of got something 
I don't know. I felt like she, I felt like she lost in, in the transaction somehow. I felt bad for her and I didn't feel bad for them. Yeah. So. I felt the same way, actually. Agreed. Yeah. And all, yeah. yeah. Also, I just got to say, uh, thank you, Abram, for mellowing out the mood because this movie is hard to review with maturity. It's a very I'll just intense say, movie. say that. Because I'm, but, but that's why it's easy to be immature. The, and, and this uh, documentary reminds me of the movie Crimes of Passion, which we also reviewed. So please click and subscribe. Yeah. For that. Yeah. But, I, yeah, but I thought it was, I thought it was weird about this. Like a lot of questions came up for me. Like, uh, do you need a certificate for this? You know, so there was that. And also for, I, I thought it was cool to, to, to take that like scientific spiritual healing approach to like to sex. And she was talking in that language, but she says cock a lot. She refers, to, I think fig, you figure she would say penis, but she doesn't. It's like, yeah, you know, with this kind of cock, you need to do this and that kind of cock. I'm like, whoa, but you know, align your chakras and stuff. I thought that was weird. And 10 minutes into the movie, she's with John who, uh, and they sit down to talk with John's therapist and she talks about the use of rubbers. At that point, I kind of flipped out. I had to pause it. I had to take a break. And I wrote in my notes, she's having sex with these guys? Is that what it, what it is? And let me just say this. I looked up rates for a sex surrogate. And uh, one woman says she makes $300 for a two hour session. And others say they get upwards to five grand for 12 to 15 sessions. So I don't know however that much is, but but there was all and but then she had a sex room to do all this stuff, and there was Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls in this sex room. And that that freaked me out a little bit, a little bit too. I, I want to add to that that they they do a thing when she mentions she has sex, because she's talking about how she doesn't like a lot of she has a lot of partners who don't like to use condoms. And then the 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 film suddenly has a voiceover mm -hmm. going over what she's saying, and it mentions the AIDS crisis mm -hmm. and that yeah, because this was and therapists at this point from the film coming out have agreed that you need to wear condoms in this. Right. It yeah. Totally goes For over what viewers. she's saying. This this movie was filmed in filmed in 1983 and then released in 85. So 80 so 81 was AIDS. So it was like getting it was uh, getting out out there. I had I was hanging out with Seth last week and we were talking about the movie and I had a conniption. Seth could say I kind of was flipping. I had a little seizure because it was so awkward. This movie it was so awkward. If awkward was pornography it would be this mo movie and i'll tell you this awkwardness now it's its own genre uh, i don't know well, if you ever saw it, it reminded like me of when they took us into sex ed class when we were kids that feeling and you're like i'm not gonna laugh i'm not gonna laugh i'm not gonna make a joke i'm not gonna go to the that that feeling and it also reminded me of a feeling judy and i did a film together it's a terrible film um and uh designed sex toys and I worked downstairs selling the sex toys. And uh, we went into the original Pink Pussycat Boutique in Brooklyn. Yeah. It was called Sex Toys. And it was funny for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was sad for the rest of like the 15 hour shoot. And there was like <laughs> one second of hotness in between the two. Like, oh, this would be fun to play with. And then you're like looking at all this plastic and rubber and artificial blow up. And you're just like, this is so stupid. And I had a dildo strapped to my head. Uh, that's it. <laughs> so, it's one of my highlights. I, I got my greatest let, moment. I, if, I, if I may talk about John. Yes. Because yeah. he had a cemented smile on his face. You know, he was always like this, like this. And then when he would say, when he would talk to you, he would look away, say what he wanted to say, then look at you and keep on going like this. That's a symptom of something going on. And I don't know what that is, but 
at 47 minutes into the movie, one of John's last sessions, he goes to Mo and he's like, I want to continue this relationship outside of therapy. I had a pause and I had to take a 10 minute break and I was screaming into a pillow. It was so awkward for me. And I pressed, I had, honestly, I tried it and I had to pause it again. Oh, I, I'm not even thinking about it. And then Sarah came in then and I'm, I paused it at that moment because I'm flipping out in the living room and Sarah come, comes in. I'm like, this good. And, I, and, she, and she didn't know what was go, going on. But she had to let him down easy. But, but, so she let him down. Then you see John with his therapist. He didn't have the smile anymore. Okay, so I think that therapy works. It's the like the fear or in your genetics, because when you, you know, going through puberty, which I guess he was kind of doing, you know, you kind of see eternity in the other person's eyes, you know, and then to lose that, you get this rush and, and fear and then and then release. But the therapy was working because I'm sure that false self he had was something that he didn't want to pay attention to, like inside. So you just focus on your outside. And that would and that kind of freaked freaked me out. And he was a cheapskate. She was even talk, talking about um, you don't even buy the expensive oil for your own cock mm -hmm. or something. I thought that was like crazy. He likes to use Vaseline or or uh, vegetable oil. Yes. No, he likes to use vegetable oil because it's cheap, cheaper. And she's like, you don't even do it for your own cock. It was it was so it was so great. Uh, oh, and John, he said that uh, he. John equates big penises with supermen. Then, uh, then you see him eating with his ex ex wife, which I thought that was weird. And that was it just seems like that was, it was really scene. awesome. It was like <laughs> it was that was it's like the death the death in marriage. That's what it was like a Beckett play. Honestly, it was more than that because so he keeps talking like his whole focus is. I have to learn how to please women. Like I'll be able to have relationships if I had a bigger penis and if I could please women, but he's really all about himself because it's like, he never talked to her about this. And, and she finally, like, I think put her fork down and turned to him and said, like, that's not it. She said something like I could list 27 things before your penis as the reason we're not married anymore. And he was like, like what? And she was like, I think she said, you're a slob. You're, yeah, yeah. Is anybody Something listening? Like a slot. It's, okay, yeah. Slot. That, which is like, which brings me to the fundamental uh, uh, problem that I run into when I see people having conversations about men empowering themselves to become better in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Because the number one thing that a man needs to have a better sexual relationship with a woman is self respect. Just mm -hmm. number one. Before anything else, the man has to have self-respect and confidence. It well, value. Have... You're talking about value because she has no value for him anymore. Well, and he doesn't have any value but, in himself. But I, I mean, like, what, what I'm saying is, like, value is a big category, right? Yeah. Within yeah. value, you have in elements, different elements. The most crucial element before anything else is dignity. The guy has been stripped of all his dignity, and I, I'm not sure... If it's all his fault, yes. maybe, no, she that's did, it. maybe she did horrible things to him too throughout the relationship. You know, who knows? Maybe, yeah. The point she, is the she guy has give. no dignity. The guy has no self-respect. He clearly doesn't know how to stand up for himself. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how good your technique is in the bedroom. You, the, you can't have a good intimate relationship if both partners don't have some self-respect and decency towards themselves and then towards each I, other. I, I got a question for a Abram. Abram, did you think John wanted his problem to be his penis and not what was really going inside in his psyche, probably stuff from childhood? Because I think you hit on something when you said the man had no dignity because that listen, ex explains him completely. Listen, when I was in my... I went through different periods of confidence and lack of confidence and overconfidence and feel it. I've been everywhere on the map when it comes to how I relate to my own um, sexuality with women. Okay. I've had the moments where I'm like, I've got to find out who th this new thing. Oh, I don't know about this pickup artist thing that they're doing. Oh, who 
And it's like, there's every possible thing in the world to make you feel like you're, to make you insecure about it. something. There's something that's inadequate about you. There's always, you can always find some inadequacy. And I think like with a guy like him who probably never had any, he never even had a high in terms of his confidence level. I mean, he may have had some peak somewhere, but it seems like he's had a lot of lows with, with uh, when it comes to his uh, self image and yeah. with self respect. And when you're that low and you feel like you're so, such garbage, you're find you're like finding every excuse, every little thing you're picking apart that's not good enough about you. So he's gonna he's gonna it's my cock is not big enough. My um, I'm not you know good looking enough. I I don't have that way about me that I just don't have it or whatever. You you can find any excuse to, to think think like you're not worthy. And so when you get into that cycle, it's just like a downward spiral and that becomes your identity and you're just like, yeah, I'm just a piece of shit. And that's why I thought that on some level, while I think that this, I don't, I don't know what the long-term thing of this is, but what I do know about people is when they're, people are really low and down in the dumps. And this is one of the things that jo Jordan Peterson says that I think is brilliant and original I don't think he's got a lot of brilliant original ideas, to be honest with you guys. Uh, as I've been really thinking about that a lot lately because he's become such a big public figure. But I think the one thing that he touched on once he became famous was that through just a little bit of encouragement from one man to another man, just a tiny bit of encouragement can send a guy from feeling like utter shit to feeling like anything is possible, at least for a time. Men don't need that much encouragement. So the idea that this woman <laughs> could sacrifice this part of herself, and I say that because this is a transactional thing that she's doing. She's giving her all yeah. to try to make this guy feel confident. She's, you know, telling him, like, and she's being honest, too, which is beautiful. I could t She's not being Bless full of shit. Heart. I mean, this, no. I, I don't believe in sex surrogacy. I don't, I think there's probably a better way, but it, if I can't imagine somebody doing a better job than she did, she did a great job with these guys. She was, she and, was and that, the, that I think those 10 weeks or whatever, I mean, that was more than enough encouragement for this guy to go out in the world and be like, you know what? I can make it with a woman. People have been doing this for thousands of years. It's not that big of a deal. And all he needed was that little push. And I think he got a big push. But that's my point, is that when you're down in the dumps, like, men walk around carrying this, like, all kinds of pain and, 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 and loneliness, and they don't talk about it, you know? And they could be real down. And, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this is not just for men. It's for, it's for women, too. But... I can only really speak in my own experience. I know that men have a certain more of a difficulty, not like to, forget about talking about feelings, but just being like, you know what? Like Sean, mm. I'm fucked up, man. I like the last three days, I've just been so down in the dumps. Everything feels like it's going wrong. My life is out of, you know, men don't say that when that's you what's mean, going man, on. It feels weird when you say that, man, but, but no, but sometimes <laughs> listen, Okay, that may be not like that, but you have a specific problem that you're struggling with. And you yeah. say to your man, you're like, you say to somebody, and, and all he gives, gives you a couple words of encouragement, and you're like, fuck, you know what? I'm going to get go to the gym. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, stand strand straight. And like, this is, see, this is why I think Jordan Peterson was so successful, because he came out with a book basically telling a bunch of guys who are down in the dumps, who felt horrible, who probably couldn't get a girlfriend had a bad relationship with their parents. You know what? If you just do a little something today, uh, you know, and these guys are like coming up to him on the street being like, I can't believe what all he did was say, you know, stand up straight and throw your shoulders back and all clean this shit that they will clean your room. Uh, mm -hmm. If you drank, if you're, if you're drinking too much and you've been drinking, you know, five, you know, a bottle of liquor a day, drink half a bottle today and then a quarter tomorrow and then you know what i mean it's like this kind of stuff and that's what it reminded me of in a lot of ways not to go on a rant yeah. about that but just like how like these guys like 
they just needed a couple good buddies, a couple people to like, you know, and maybe I think if, if anything, maybe the younger guy, he needed a prostitute of some sort. He needed some. That's, that's what I, that's what he I needed kind of, to kind of just guy. break the, you know, thing. Yeah, or whatever. Speaking about, speaking about him, there was a session where he had a spectrum. Yes. And the flashlight. Yeah. And he was like, oh, and all that stuff. I mean, I, I remember I was eating, I was, I was at Frank's Pizza with Mike Rose and he, t he told me about the anatomy and what you're supposed to do if you're ever introduced. And, and that helped me a lot because I would have no idea. And then I like went into some medical books and I'm like, oh, okay. So Mike you know? Rose was better to you than Kipper's brother was because Kipper's brother was like, Wow, I've never even yeah. seen. I don't know my way around that, and I do fine. And they're and they're kind of waspy. I'll I'll say that. And yes. waspy folk, waspy folk, they really don't talk about their feelings. They'd rather commit suicide. You know. Well, they're, they're, not, they're also. I don't know. I thought they were pretty expressive, and they're also like, they seem to be you know, up, upper middle middle class, upper middle class yeah. intellectual. They were all very mm -hmm. articulate intellectual people. Every one of them, the surrogate. The, the clients, the therapists. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but but I'm her saying, brother and her father yeah. weren't that yes. artic articulate, and I thought it was like I thought it was a a dirty move to corner the father and be like, well, you didn't do this and this and this. Oh, and by the way, I help men e ejaculate or whatever she was saying to him. It it did kind of feel like she was like, no, dad, you're sitting there. Well, and you're yeah. going to hear this. And I thought that was kind of. But she said that strange. older guy at the end was like, she didn't. She was kind of. She was kind of like, turned off by him and kind of, you know. Yeah, she was bad mouthing him kind but of. But at the end, she kind of fell in love with him. Did you see that? Because she re she said he reminded her of her father. He, this whole movie is a case study on Kipper, who had relationship issues with his mother, who never really held him as a child, so he didn't know what affection with a woman was like. He became scared of them. His brother became an animal. So they basically were the two siblings with the opposite. same experience. Oh, that's Extremely fascinating. Completely opposite, right? That's fascinating. And then you have the woman who had an alcoholic father who beat the mother in front of them. And she's pissed off. And women were taught, don't be angry. Like, we're not supposed to be, like, men aren't supposed to cry. And women aren't supposed to be angry. She fucking hates her dad. She was she angry wants her dad to apologize. And terrified, too. She so desperately wants his love and hates him. Be it's that thing of like, I love you because you're my dad, but I hate you because you're a fucking alcoholic asshole who hurt me deeply. And now I'm afraid to have relationships with people because of the shit that you did in front of me. So the best that I can do is sleep with 400 men to practice intimacy. And will you please listen to me? I've told you 17 times I have sex with men for money. And he's like, what? Well, part of he it said, is he said he feels like a whore in a church. Well, that he's was his a in a church. But she's, and he, he hopes so, whatever she does has nothing to do about Freud. Well, <laughs> but that's the thing. You know, at least in this, I, I think Freud is wrong most of the time, but this is a very Freudian. I mean, she's clearly yeah. trying to like this this her she wants to hurt him by letting him know that she's doing this work yes. because it's her power his sexuality is her power over her father he's saying those two things to her to like push her buttons so she comes out and throws it at him and they just go through this dynamic over and over again yeah so what's you know, about he alcoholics say, i don't want to hear about your work he uses an analogy for her work i i think that's like a prostitute in a church and he says, I hope it's not about Freud. So yeah. it's like this. Listen, I, I think it's, I think this is a point where we need, I, I just, I need to make a, a, a little pivot. We've talked a mm -hmm. lot about these people and what's going on. And this is a documentary. I want to say one thing about this movie. And maybe this is starting to be like closing arguments. This is actually an incredible narrative film. This is a, mm -hmm. it's close to a perfect movie. As I've ever seen in a documentary format, this did not feel like a documentary, like a typical document. There's a story arc, and it's an it's an incredibly powerful story about really main, about three main characters. Um, I think everybody should see this movie. It is, I, it's really like I said to Seth, 
It's as close to a perfect movie as I could ever imagine in a documentary. It's very touching. It's very emotional. It's it is really, moving. It's really moving. screwed up. And it and you go mm -hmm. into it think you go into it with judgments and you leave it, you leave if you're anything like me, you leave the movie being like, and I'm a prude, like I'm a prude. I don't like seeing this kind of stuff. I don't like a lot of overly sexual stuff just for the sake of being sexual. And I went into this being very judgmental, being like, yeah, this is kind of fucked up. And just as it went along, I'm like, holy shit, this is a this is a masterpiece. So <laughs> So kudos, Seth. Yeah, it was it was moving. The 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 editors really knew what they were do doing. It's like the healing that she d is doing is as messed up as the damage that was done to them. Because I was, it was really awkward, and I kind of see that how you unfold somebody's uh, dis dysfunction, and uh, it it reminded me of something called the Wiseman effect. And what the Wiseman effect, there was a documentarian in the early 60s. He went on for years and years named Frederick Wiseman. And he found out that if you just point a camera at somebody, they're going to be shy at first. But then after a while, they're going to be a better version of themselves and unconsciously kind of like act for the camera. And I think with that, when they were filming the dad, Moe's dad and Moe's brother in that it was really connected because they didn't move. And if it was that conversation was ever held in a living room in their house, the dad would have left or said something or something, but they were all there and they couldn't move. And I think it has that Wiseman effect. And it really drew that shit out of, out of them because the brother probably heard this stuff before. And he's like, yeah, my dad and I would just go fishing and stuff like he never hit me or whatever. And he, that's how he rationalized it, I guess. But I just, I, I just thought it was a, one last thing. I just have a phobia with the year 1983. I know how ridiculous that sounds, but 1983 just creeps me out. I'll say it. The music, the movies, everything. When she was wearing the lace and stuff and the short hair, I don't know. But uh, but um, there was a corniness in Mo, especially that I I thought was. Uh, was like I guess as you were saying her like the tragic character she was it just mm -hmm. seems like she uses this corny humor on, over top of whatever like not whatever she she says it's just when when she said goodbye to Kipper he walked out the door and she said see you later and then closes the door and she goes like that and then she opens the door again uh, I'll never see you again I mean goodbye and she closes the door again and laughing I'm like that's so corny but it's great it, cinema. But it's like a defense mechanism. No, it's a defense mechanism. It's like natural born killers. Yeah, when but it Juliet was Lewis remembers her authentic. childhood as the sitcom. Huh? It was authentic. I, I mean, I've never seen, yeah, well, I've yeah, never yeah, seen so it much just, authenticity in a documentary before. You've never you've never been with someone and they go and you go, I'll see you next time at work, and you don't work there, and they go, you too. Like that happens all the time. When I worked at the movie theater, if I ever exchanged money with somebody, even if I was buying so something, I would still say, "Enjoy your show." Every time, I was like, "Like enjoy your show." Thanks. <laughs> yeah, but it, oh, also, uh, Seth, this movie inspired me, so I want to make sure that you're being health healthy. So, Seth, how do you treat your penis? Oh God! Um, oh, we're not gonna I, do that. I, I, I'm probably angry. Well, at my penis. Wait, hold on. I, a, A, Abram. Never mind. All right. Oh, do you treat her penis? What? Ask me. What do you have? Okay. Do you, Abram, do you have vegetable oil? Um, We're not going to go there. With... <laughs> but, for what it's, but for what it's worth, I rarely do that. <laughs> All right. I've been, yeah, I've been, I've been working on I don't on really that. do that. But I know, I just think it was weird. Well, my I guess my morbid point is, is that they used words and terminology that has a different significance in ourselves that we usually don't talk well, about. Because it, I, I'm, I had to be immature because it kind of freaked me out. I no, had but seizures. This is why it's doing this. Because the reason they use those terms, from the little I know about this, which is too much already, um, they use those terms, they say cock and balls and stuff instead of like penis and testicles, because that's probably what your partner's gonna do, right? Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that's probably what that's, she's going to do. A, that's obvious. You don't you, you don't use clinical or childish terms. You use the kind of terms that like are colloquially used among grown-ups when they're doing what they're doing. I guess. I believe the term is juicier in the uh, new age polyamorous community. It's a juicier, more yeah. But this terminology is always changing all the time. Whatever. But um, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I never heard of juicier. Judy, did you I, have yeah. any? Uh, how are we on time? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to throw in the comment. Sean was mentioning something about um, women being promiscuous and the effect on them earlier. Something about that, right? Um, and what I found over the years is, is talking to women is that, um, yes, women who are, high, and I'm not going to say all because there's no full category, but most, the majority of women that I know who had multiple partners or were highly promiscuous earlier on in their life or during a period of time, typically high school or college, um, have major regrets later. Yeah. It's almost like there's a delayed spiritual effect. And I wonder if it has to do something with hormones and maturity, but it's one of those things where women might engage in that behavior and think, well, I'm, I'm in control. I can be just like a man, you know, I can have sex like a man, all this stuff. And they do. And they tell themselves for sometimes years and then all of a sudden they hit, it's usually, in my experience talking to women, it's usually in their late 20s, early 30s that they then sort of start to like the crack, the, the facade cracks and they go, it's like almost like, a, oh God, what had I done? And I know as, a, you know, with the other work that I do, sex, having intercourse or having any type of sexual relationship is merging your, your, your spirit with another person. And yep. even if it's in this drunken thing, you've still... I think as a yeah. woman have taken on a little bit of energy of this person. And so you're walking around with extra things on you and missing from you. And I think it's just one of those things that unfortunately young women don't understand yeah. until they're older and there's no going back. I mean, you, there's yeah. things you can do. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I just think it's one of those things where women go into it going, yeah, I'm fine. I can fuck like a guy and whatever. And it's like, I don't know, in my experience, that's not true to do it as um, when you're in a relationship, that's totally different, yeah. right? Go, go crazy. But when you're doing it with multiple people, yeah. I haven't yet at least personally spoken to someone who over a long period of time was like, yeah, I'm totally cool with it. They're, they probably exist. I'm not saying it's not out there. I just think the majority is not the case. I think I'm really glad that you brought that up because yeah. it's kind of, that should be like one of the closing statements of this whole thing. I have been studying that phenomenon lately, very carefully. I've, I've been very interested in that because I've been meeting so many women who've been basically expressing what you've been expressing. And like, that's, sex is not just something you do with your body. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it. It's not just some physical mechanical thing. There's more going on there. And there are consequences. Yeah. And if you abuse the, if you abuse mechan sex mechanically, you're going to have trouble pair, pair bonding down the line. It, it, in statistically speaking, mm -hmm. that's a big, that's a, a big thing. It does, it does make pair bonding more difficult. And like Judy said, um, there are ways of getting over the, the just like any kind of trauma. Yeah. But we're not taught that that's a traumatic pattern. And, um, you know, and I, I think that, and if anybody who's watching this is this bringing stuff up for them, go talk to somebody who's professional, get some help. I mean, I'm saying that too, this is the first th thing we've done where I think that needs to be said, because this, if you're going to go watch yeah. this movie and you have issues like around, um, intimacy or even listening to this podcast, any type of have, sexuality or sex trauma, any kind give of a, sex yeah, trauma, give a trigger warning on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm not big on trigger warnings. It deserves warnings, a trigger warning. This one does. I think this is a documentary. This is a movie you shouldn't see unless if you're, if you're still struggling with that stuff, you should maybe, if you're going to see it, see it with somebody. And if you need to get help, there's people, there's a lot of people out there who can help you. So. Yeah. Actually, on, on that note, uh, when Sarah came yeah. home and she was watching me wa watch it and watching me cringe and, and, you know, she like stepped in the room and she's like, I'm glad you're watching this. Maybe you'll learn something. And then she left. That's, That's what, I'm like, yo, said? yeah, Listen, it's OK. Is it's she okay. Hoping you no. learn? Well, she didn't say it, but she was, you know, she knew I would laugh. By okay. saying yeah, it the she way, was saying the way it she, tongue in, she, she was saying it tongue in cheek, I guess. Uh, all right. Yeah, but mm, <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying too. 
because I guess and and Abram, thanks for setting the tone because I I know this it this sub subject like I don't know it just makes me uncomfortable. It's like there's some things you're you're not supposed to talk about, and then they're talking about it. That's that's I mean I guess that's, that's therapy, dude. That's what it's about. I know, I know, I know. Documentary. Yeah. I know, but you're not supposed. That's all I'm saying. Because I guess yeah. I guess you're not supposed to talk about it because you you it's it is as Abram said more than a mechanical action and you join and as Judy said you 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 join I just I just thought it was weird I did like uh, I just wanted to mention John's convertible that little uh, midlife crisis car that he that he had <laughs> good for good, him. good for him and yeah I'll just I'll just leave it on I guess yeah those are my uh, closing closing thoughts i'm yeah. just checking out my notes notes here and she didn't mention well let me just one last thing she didn't mention having any creditations you know they you don't they have don't, to right? they don't they have their own little yeah. weird they thing be, i think they have to go to social work school for two years or something like that there's some no. sort of association they have an association but like it's not rigorous in any kind of way nor should or it policing be. come on because it's it, like they can't strip your license I guess. it's a gray sure area can. It's a great, who's mm -hmm. that? You can create your own new accreditation thing. I, I'm going to yeah, create good, my own. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's like- I was just curious. Because watching this, I'm like, can't I just be a sex surrogate no, too? It's, listen, it's, border, it's borderline illegal because it's borderline prostitution, okay. which, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get, that's a whole other conversation, whether that should be legal or not. I don't, that's, I don't even yeah. want to get, get into that today. But like, it's, it's a gray area. It's not- clear and it's not really like a professional service that you go to school for and you get accredited for even though they have some kind of a loose unions and organization because yeah, she yeah. sounded like educated on the subject that's just what i was you know it's not more than a hobby i guess for, well she was doing it professionally and, just, yeah just because anyway, it's not Marie a Sullivan. bless sex your sex heart sex. marie so sullivan you know like you for, for like a yeah. psychologist dude yeah you, you have to yeah. You can't just like ooh, walk ooh, into any. Just even thinking about it. You can't just walk into a bordello and say that the guy who runs it or the woman who runs it. I'd like the sex surrogate today. Like they won't know what you're talking about. You have to be referred to by a sexologist. Ooh, just all right. I don't know. It just gives yeah. me the creeps more than any all right. movie ever. Abram, has. what's your final thoughts? I really said everything I think that everything. there is okay. to say about this film. It's very disturbing. It's very powerful. And it deal. It, I've never seen a documentary deal with such a difficult, uh, uncomfortable subject in in such a way in, with so much dignity and respect. Where I came away from it thinking, okay, like there's not a single person in this entire process that I'm like, oh, they did it for some kind of dirtbag reason. You know, because yeah. it's yeah, I could so easily I, see this is such an easy subject to be exploitative about and to make fun mm -hmm. of and to and and like it was just about as good as you could do it. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, I don't regret seeing it. You know, I'm, I'm not about to see it anytime soon again, but I, I, <laughs> I would maybe see it again if there you know, was a good reason to see it. And it's a definitely a, I think this movie should be like put in a category of, you know, uh, Library of Congress, important historical docudrama, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I, I think, enjoyed watching it because I enjoy watching movies that evoke an emotional response within myself and give me something to think about. And um, I felt so fascinated and so sad. It was definitely a tragedy, the whole film, but it was really interesting and I could understand and I could empathize with all, all of them. Um, but I left the movie going, oh my God, where are these people now? What happened to them? And I was like Googling all over the internet and I found the same article that Seth did. So um, I, do, I do like that in terms of filmmaking. I love watching a movie that has me still thinking about it instead of just like shutting off the TV and like being like, I'm hungry, what do I want to eat? Um, it's more like I think about it and I'm like, oh, that's curious. And my mind reflects on it. So if you do like movies like that and you have the stomach for this or the, you know, the it piques your curiosity, I would check mm -hmm. it out and let us know what you think. That's a yes, that's a good word. Please uh, click and subscribe and let us 
and comment below. Yeah, let us know what you think. If you've seen this movie, uh, definitely interested. Because I don't as think well a lot of people have seen it. Did I say no. where they ended up in our closing statements? Where yes, they, uh, take it away. Okay. So um, turn it off, like, or you can watch the movie. It's not in the movie. But they went, what, 25 years later, and I thought, tried to track them down. And they couldn't find John. Kipper had continued to be shy, though he dated a little bit, and finally, like, thrown down the, the gauntlet and got a mail order bride from the Philippines, mm -hmm. who he's married to and he has children with. And this is 2010, 25 years late, later, this was 2010. They yes, so around there, yeah. And, um, the article was Maureen, written in 2011, I think. Yeah. And Maureen O'Sullivan was in a terrible car accident, which broke almost every bone in her face. Jesus. She was like in traction for almost a year, Damn. did no Damn. eye socket. And her boyfriend was with her the whole time. And she was like, maybe I should be more serious about this boyfriend. And she had a total uh, spiritual awakening. Yeah. That's, that's what happened to them. And, uh, yeah. But it doesn't say whether she ever got married to him or stayed with him and had kids or anything. No, I mean, that's well, the she, thing about- She didn't have kids. The early article didn't say she did. But she was with them as a, she was with the same guy as of the time of the writing of the article. Yeah, I yeah so. that, that's what I took from it. I well, go that's good. It. Good, for, good for them. Yeah, it, it still sounded tragic. The article did not have. Yeah, the, the article sounded tragic. And it, you know, yeah. you want to kind of think that people get better after you see them in a documentary. You're like when mm -hmm. you read somebody's, I remember reading Judy Collins autobiography. And she talked about how she didn't commit suicide and her son went through some bad times and he struggled with suicide. And then I finished it. And then about a year or two later, her son committed suicide. Jesus. And I felt, oh, that's so sad. Like she has to write another book now. I mean, not that it's sad that she has to write another book. Well, listen, but let's, let's be, let's have yeah. a little perspective here. The, the, uh, they're, they're better than we, we saw them in the documentary. The guy ended up getting married and having a family and she ended up- yeah staying with the guy and quitting the work that she was doing. She probably mm -hmm. you know, found a guy who was like willing to overlook a lot of that stuff and, you know, and stick with her. And through John didn't and respond. And John yeah, didn't John. respond. Who knows what happened to him? But I mean, as far as we know, the people in the, the article, they're all doing better than they were when uh, we last saw them at the end of the documentary. So yeah, we'd love yeah. to see John again. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I was wondering if he's still alive. I was trying to do the numbers in my head. Oh, he wasn't that old, yeah. so he very well could. He be. was forty. He would have been seventy. But he looked he like he was been, seventy. He would have been. He's seventy back then. So now, if he's still alive, he would be like eighty-two. No, yeah. he was forty-five back then. Yeah, yeah and eighty-four, eighty-three, eighty-three. So, oh, you, oh, you're saying as of the writing of the article, he would have been. Yeah. Uh, seventy, and now he'd be eighty. Okay. He's like eighty. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll maybe find out. Maybe never find yeah. out. I feel so uh, sad. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Well, he got to have yeah, a, I he mean, got to have an experience with a woman, uh, uh, you know. And how how much yeah. how much time do we have left? Because if not, we just not much. Not much. We're over. Okay. We're at yeah. So, just, so, okay. so this week, someone will tape me, and I'll I'll tell my story about when I was 24 and I went to go see a psychotherapist about getting a sex surrogate. I'll tell that story. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we'll I do a part two. I didn't go for it. Okay, then uh, there's Judy. no there there. Judy, tell us about <laughs> the um, tell us about uh, your pick for next week. Next week. Okay, I have no idea if any of you guys have seen this film, and um, and I can't say that I love like love love this film like like Sean loves Clue because that's <laughs> not true. Uh, the uh, my feelings for it, but it's one of those things where when I think of like obscure films that I enjoyed or I had like. As, you, as I said, I like films that evoke a response within me and make me think. Um, and this is this is a film. So it's from 2012. It's a Canadian body horror film called American Mary. Body horror? Has anyone seen mean? it? What? what does body horror mean? Cronenberg is body horror, horror. And it has to do with the physical body. So I'll read you. Um, so it's by these twin sisters, um, Jen and Sylvia Soska, who did a film. Is it the same twins by any chance that were in The Shining? 
No, no. no. Not These not are Canadian good. film, uh, they're sisters who went to film school. They did a, a trailer in film school uh, called Dead Hooker in a Trunk. I didn't watch the movie. Um, that has a, a specific cult following. But what happened was, is that they became frustrated. They couldn't get that movie out. It was shot on like a $2,500 budget. So they had a conversation with Eli Roth, who said, let go of trying to sell your film and work on your next film. And they pitched to him a couple ideas. And he said, I really like this one about a medical student. So it forced them to write this film. And they basically took their experience about being these women who are into like disgusting horror um, and not fitting into a mold. So they wrote it about this medical student who doesn't feel like she belongs within the medical community. And she ends up going into basically extreme plastic surgery. And, uh, and so the film, um, and I can't remember if it's this film or their first film, but they couldn't raise money for it. So they traveled and their parents put their house on the line to raise money for the film. Wow. This is wow. 2012, it's called American Mary. This is, I think American this is on Mary. Hulu. This is on, I saw this on Hulu. I'm yeah, pretty so sure. I think, actually, I don't know if I saw it in the theater or not. I'm going to look it up and so I can tell everybody all the places that it is. Um, yeah. I saw clips of this. American Mary. Mary. And it's funny, Canadian. 2012 Canadian body horror. By yeah, Jen and it. Sylvia Soska, starring mm -hmm. Catherine Isabel, Antonio Cupo, and Tristan Risk. Yes. Okay, cool. And I remember it being very pretty. They also, the twins make an appearance as uh, what are their characters? Uh, the evil, something demonic Berlin twins. I'm totally butchering it. There's a lot of good indie horror films from the two, early 2010s. That you've put Canadians us on. Canadians yes. know what they're doing. Ca uh, like, Canadians in horror, too. Canadians yeah. know horror. Better than comedy, straight up. So <laughs> it's available on Tubi if you want to watch it for free with oh, commercials. Tubi? Yeah, nice. for free with commercials on Tubi. And uh, it's also available on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. um, let me just double check if it's actually... It's Yeah, it's available. I believe it's available to stream on Amazon Prime. So yeah, that's you got some yeah. options. Shouldn't be a hard shocked. one. It shouldn't cost you anything to watch this one. What's that? <laughs> no, I'm just so curious what you guys are going to think because I'm like, it's pretty and it's like weird and you guys might be like horrified or maybe not. I don't know. Every horror movie you've picked so far, I've really enjoyed. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think it was from a period in time where I was able, I was making an effort to watch as many films as I could. And it was like around that time. So 